Yeah, well, I I was defeated by a cougar tail last evening. <laughs> I, got, I got back to my I got back to my room and I got about a third of the way into it. I just couldn't do it. That's I was good. completely wired. <laughs> he didn't sleep all night. <laughs> <laughs> This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. Joining me now, the head baseball coach of the BYU Cougars. He is Mike Littlewood. And coach, after a long offseason, the season is here. How excited are you for, uh, for the 2022 season to finally be here? Oh, man, I, I, I can't tell you how excited I am, especially to have just a, the team we have, a much more mature team, basically the same team we've had the last couple of years with some experience under their belt uh, and, a, a, and a, some great additions to the team. So we're ready to get going. Yeah, and w- what are your overall thoughts? I mean, because obviously the guys have been practicing and uh, for the last you know couple of weeks, had the off season, the fall season. So this team has been able to get together and, and see what you, can, what you can do. What have been your overall impressions early on? Well, yeah, I mean, we've, we've been out practicing basically like our spring training from September 7th or whatever, you know, first day, first day of school, we've been uh, ready to go. Um, I think overall, it's just uh, just a much ma- more mature team. Um, we're going to have a strong pitching staff, the deepest staff we've ever had. I think we're 12 pitchers deep that can actually go in games and, and help us get outs. Um, but on the position player side, I'm, I'm really excited just because they've grown up. They're, they're much more able to put together good at-bats. Um, they'll compete a little bit better. They have an understanding of, of what the game's all about instead of just kind of going up there, oh, I hope, hope I can hit the ball. And so... That's just the maturity level and, and how we're going about things and, and, and our comfort level. Um, and it kind of showed when we played Utah. Uh, we're always comfortable when, when we scrimmage. So that's, we want to take that scrimmage attitude and that comfort level out to, out to really real games. And, and I think the two scrimmages we had at Utah showed those. We played at a really nice comfort level, confident, and um, hopefully we can continue that at Indiana State this week. Well, and you mentioned a lot of guys returning, but you also have some very impressive newcomers. And you already talked about the, the pitching staff as a whole. I think that's probably most evident there because, you know, you do have guys that were in the starting rotation last year, but a lot of guys coming in that are part of those 17 newcomers that will see time in the rotation. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on the starting rotation heading into this weekend? Well, yeah, we'll, so we'll start Jack Sterner. He was a, he's been our uh, starter last year, our number one starter last year. Um, you know, kind of a power fastball, works downhill, good, some uh, good down and in run and good slider, really developing his secondary pitches. Nate Daly will go uh, our second game, uh, which will be game one against Marshall. Uh, transfer from CSI, big, strong kid, um, should, should be in the low to mid-90s with, with great control. And then you talk about newcomers, Jansen Kiesel, uh, from Gunnison High School will be our, our third starter, uh, which would be game three or game two against right. Marshall on that, on that doubleheader. But Jansen can run it up there to the mid-90s, and, and uh, just really I'm looking forward to seeing him develop uh, over the course of his three years here. And, and uh, I'm sure he's going to be a high draft pick when he leaves, but he's got a, just a, a lightning arm. And then game four will go with Ryan Brady. That's going to be Ohio State on Monday. And so I, I feel really good about that. We have Bryce Robison, who's kind of – he was a starter last year, but had a little bit of a, an elbow issue, so we kind of kept him out this fall. He's right there, just kind of – we can piggyback him as a starter. He can come in in the second inning and finish a game for us. And I really like the ability – to use him as a hybrid, kind of a starter, reliever type guy. Well, and with Bryce and, you know, Reed McLaughlin, the, the, the bullpen is stacked for you. You have so many options in the pen. Yeah, I mean, Cy Nielsen from the left side and Boston Mavis and, and Cy, um, um, Cooper McKeon from the left side, um, right side Carter Smith and uh, Reed McLaughlin, who have experience. All those guys have experience. I think we're really going to be excited about a left-hander from Bingham High School, Justice Riser, um, true freshman, throws four pitches for strikes, Really competes. His first outing at Utah up there came in and struck out the side. And just you would never know if he's thrown three balls in a row or struck out the side. He's just got the same demeanor. Very athletic. Feels his position. Got a great pickoff move. Just kind of does it all for us. Let's talk about the position players. And there's a lot of very familiar names, whether it's Pintar at second, Watkins at short, Mitch McIntyre, Cole Gamble. Lots of guys that game in and game out each uh, can be the guy. Well, it's fun to see. 
the same team. One one thing about BYU baseball and really other sports here at BYU is we have trouble having continuity because of missions and you know guys getting married and they decide not to play, so then you have to bring another guy in. So you, know, you can have an 18 year old or a 26 year old and anything in between. But it's but this year we have some continuity. We've had the same guys for two or three years in in a row now, and so. Yeah, those names you mentioned, and you include Josh Cowden, you include um, Hayden Latham and Ryan Sapiti, who's swinging it really well, um, Jacob Rogers and Austin Deming. Just going down, just going down the line. I mean, it, it's uh, really exciting for us. We do have three new guys at the catching spot: Colin Ruder, a freshman. I know you, you want to touch on him a little bit, but um, Mason Strong, a freshman. Um, right now, Mason's hurt; he won't go on the first trip. Chase Peterson and then J.D. Gardner. So we're four deep at the catching spot, but uh, Collins really stepped up for us. Yeah, let's let's go there. This is a freshman catcher from Mississippi, and this guy is special. D1 Baseball has him as the WCC Freshman of the Year. We all know how important the catcher position is for a lot of different reasons. What type of impact do you think he can make his freshman year? Well, I think I think just that. I think he's clearly going to be um, an All Conference type player. He, if you just if you're around him a little bit, he's he's got a certain calmness. He knows how to handle the pitching staff. Uh, big, strong kid. I mean, I think it was Friday. He got a fastball inside and just kind of pulled his hands in, got jammed a little bit, and hit it up into the trees in left field. But he he just kind of has he he's got an old soul. I, I guess that would be the the best way to put it. He he never gets rushed, um, never gets his motor going too quick, um, and he's just one of those guys. He, he, we're going to hit him fourth in the lineup behind Cole Gamble, and um, I think he's going to be just an impact guy for us this year. Let's uh, let's go to maybe your biggest concern, or maybe even a better word, your biggest unknown right now heading into the season is what? I would say third base. I mean, we we need a guy. We have those those guys, Austin Deming and, and Jacob Rogers, and freshman Ozzy Pratt's been playing over there a little bit. Brock Watkins plays a great third base, and and our plan a little bit was to move Pintar to short and Brock over to third just to to try that. Um, Andrew Pintar's arm's not quite coming back to play short. I think it will eventually, so he's, we're going to play him at second to start off with. And great player. I mean, he's I, I would assume Penny's going to be gone after this year with a draft, but having a great year. But I would say that's probably the biggest concern for me. We do have guys, though. Um, yeah. It's just going to be who can go in there and swing it, and play good defense um, for nine innings. That's that's what we're looking for out of that position. All right, let's focus on the the opening series in Port Charlotte, Florida. It is the Snowbird Baseball Classic, and as you mentioned, uh, up first is Indiana State. That will be on Friday, and that's a team that's been in the uh, the postseason in 2021 and in 2019. Then a doubleheader on Saturday against Marshall, and then Ohio State on Monday. Uh, just maybe overall thoughts on this tournament in general, and then first up, Indiana State. Yeah, it's the first time we've been down there. Ohio State runs the tournament, um, and it's w- w- my first thought is we're playing 27 innings in 24 hours, <laughs> getting off the plane at like nine o'clock, and then and then playing uh, a bunch of games. But obviously, this time of year, guys can they're, they're rested and, and ready to go. But um, you know, I just Indiana State's a really good team. I mean, they're they're going to be a lot like uh, Texas State was last year as far as being older and more mature, but they're going to be more talented. Be, they did go to a regional; they got most of their guys back. So it's going to be a good challenge for us. I mean, it's a team that we should be able to, to match up with really well. I mean, I would expect our team to be a regional-type team. Um, so that should be a, a really good uh, uh, game for us. And then we play Marshall twice. Um, you know, it, it, in baseball, it's like you never know. It, it's it's a team that we should beat. But um, baseball's weird, man. They, you get a pitcher up there who has good stuff that day and or you're lining out to people and – and so we need to play two solid games, and, and uh, you know hopefully we'll come, come away with two wins. And then obviously Ohio State, who uh, won the Big Ten tournament last year and, and uh, has a lot of their players back. And I'm, I'm excited to see what Ryan Brady's going to do with those guys. And, and uh, you know, he's, Ryan's been on a mission, then came home with co- uh, af- during COVID and left and came back. And so he, he did a great job just following through with his mission, and now he's, now he's back and ready to go. I'm assuming you're probably like me. You've been checking to see what the weather is supposed to be like in uh, in Florida. 80 degrees, uh, so I think that's going to be welcomed. Uh, you packing a lot of shorts for this trip? I wish I could go to the beach a little bit, but I don't think so. The only shorts I, I'm packing are the ones I wear under my my baseball pants. No, no morning run on the beach to kind of get, uh, get I'm ready sure, to go? Yeah, I'm sure I'll figure out some time. <laughs> well, Coach, uh, appreciate you stopping by. Really looking forward to this. And uh, just a reminder, uh, all of the games can be heard on the radio, BYU Radio 107.9 FM and or uh, the app. 
as well as BYUCougars.com slash live radio. So lots of ways for you to be able to uh, listen to the games. Uh, myself, Tuckett Slade, will have the call for you uh, beginning on Friday against Indiana State. Should be fun. For all the details on times and where you can listen, make sure you go to uh, BYUCougars.com and go to the baseball page and check out the schedule. Coach, let's, uh, let's go. I'm ready for some baseball. Let's do it. Yep. Let's do it. Thanks. Go Cougs. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. February frenzy of West Coast Conference basketball. BYU needed some incredible offensive performances to get through LMU and Pepperdine. Defense, optional at times, it would appear, Jerem, in these unexpected high-scoring road contests. But the fact of the matter is, BYU won both games. And as Jerem just told you, they are still the last team in, according to ESPN bracketologist Joe Lenardi. So, Jerem, BYU did what they needed to do, win the games. Does that give you confidence they will beat St. Mary's in Moraga after a week off? Now, game to game can be very different, right? But if we're talking about trends, no, BYU didn't trend in a defensive direction that would uh, make me feel confident BYU is going to win in St. Mary's. Offensively, though, eh, pretty good, right? Which brings us to our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Two of them, courtesy of Cougar Stats. One, BYU had its two highest offensive efficiency games versus D1 opponents against LMU and Pepperdine. Okay, then. Offense, baby. I'll take it. I'll take it. Number two, BYU also had its two lowest non-Gonzaga defensive efficiency games of the season. Throw that out. <laughs> Terry, Nashif, <laughs> Terry Nashif is pleased, right? Uh, BYU run and gun. It concerns me that BYU had to shoot 64% and go 15 of 23 to beat Pepperdine by six. That concerns me because it's like, oh, my gosh, what if BYU only shot 50%? Would they have lost? Like, why is uh, Houston Millette going for 31? Like, who is this guy? He's a freshman, right? Ridiculous. Pepperdine started four freshmen. But listen, uh, let, let's, let's look at both sides of this. The good. BYU won. And they played really well on one side of the ball and got it done. They, they shot they the ball incredibly well. And Caleb Lona was awesome. Yeah, Caleb Lona at 14, found some confidence, hit two threes. How about that? That's all Alex Barcella, career night. Like, amazing. Nine of ten. Oh, my gosh. Seniors he was doing senior things. He, he was on fire. Lucas. Like, it was good to get the win on Thursday night. But I'm like, ah, why, why, is it, why, is it, why is it this close? It could have easily gone the other way, right? Winning is awesome, no doubt. But if we're t- – period. If we're talking trends, yeah, BYU's not trending in the, in the right direction to feel confident to beat St. Mary's on Saturday. But, again, games can vary v- very quickly. Like – just because you play this way one night doesn't mean you're not going to play, you know, uh, a similar way the next night. BYU could totally this week load up and be like, we're all in on defense like, like we were in Provo. We'll score enough. What was the score? 52-43, I think. Like, that could happen again. But maybe BYU is like, you know what? We just have to score. We, we lost it on defense a little bit. Foose is injured. We'll see if Foose plays Saturday. Like, Foos, that was a surprise Saturday. It was like, oh, my gosh. Tiki's playing well. Caleb played well. Maybe that's the new formula. Every game is different. But BYU's still in the hunt. BYU's still in the bracket, barely. But if BYU beats St. Mary's, they might be off the bubble. Like, it might be that big of a win. We'll see if they can get it done. If you have a season sweep of St. Mary's and you just pick up another road quadrant one victory, and now you've got the whatever it is. I know that the numbers are fluctuating in the net rankings, but if you've got eight or nine quad one and quad two wins and you've got four quad one wins – Yes, BYU should feel more comfortable yeah. after they beat, which they will, LMU and Pepperdine in Provo. Like BYU's not losing those games in Provo. Got to take care of business in Moraga. Yeah, do we – okay, back to that point. Do we feel like be, it was because they were road games that they were close? Maybe. And, and I like think, at home, you don't think it's going to be close? I do not think it'll be close. So then it's road then, games. right? Sure. Ro- because it was road? Road gets weird. And when you're throwing in the fact that Foos didn't play against Pepperdine – I feel like he would have made a huge impact in BYU's defensive efficiency at the rim. Having three of the four bigs out, I guess Caleb's a big, three of the five, 
It's brutal. Rough. It's absolutely brutal. And in that brutal. gym, there's some weird mojo with BYU historically. Like, it just is. Or were they three and four? It's, or or, it or was, four, and, four and five going into that game? At, at one point, BYU was worse at Pepperdine than they were at Gonzaga. It's so crazy. <laughs> it more wins in That's, the kennel than they did at Firestone I, Fieldhouse. I think it like you're five into the WCC or something. Good it was crazy. Yeah. Hey, so the question that I just asked you, Jeremy, is am I confident that BYU will go and win? I'll tell you what does not make me confident. 18 turnovers against Pepperdine. Woof. It's that simple to me. For BYU to have a shot to win at St. Mary's, ball security. Ball security. Which we don't phrase that in basketball, but I agree. It's don't, like, don't, don't turn the ball over 18 times against Pepperdine and BYU wins by 20. Wait, so if BYU didn't make the shot, they turned it over. Because they missed 18 shots. Yes. And they had 18 turnovers. Which is crazy. <laughs> that is a crazy stat. Yeah. You shoot 64%. Insane. And you win by 6 because you turn the ball over 18 times. Yeah, it, it intimidates me because you know who stinks? Pepperdine and LMU. They're bad teams. Don't turn the ball over. BYU barely won. 18 <laughs> times against Pepperdine. And BYU's ball security against LMU was almost equally as bad. Yes. So hopefully BYU can correct that. They did what they needed to do. This, place, this, this team was in a weird place. They got some wins. I don't like how they did it, but I love that they did it. And now you can load up for the biggest game of the season at St. Mary's Saturday that you need to win to feel like you can go into Vegas and be in an in position and perhaps avoid being on Gonzaga's side of the bracket. Because yeah. if you're, you're on Gonzaga's side of the bracket and you lose St. Mary's, you probably need a semi-win over Gonzaga to make the tourney. Yikes. That's how I feel. Like We'll see how it shakes out. But that's the worst-case scenario. Value possession. Yeah. Play defense. How did BYU win all of those weird, ugly games early? They valued possession and they BYU played was, defense. BYU put some wax on that and was like, it's not going to be weird. We're just going to score a bunch. How about that? We'll just make all the shots. Like Spencer Johnson came back. He's been in a funk. Caleb Lohner's been in a funk. They showed up, which is great. Seneca Knight's been good. BYU Tijon Lucas needed it. Last all two of games it. has been really good. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Joining us now over Zoom is a man who is a champion in our hearts and an actual national champion with BYU football, dual threat analyst Blaine Fowler. Blaine, happy Monday. I uh, hope you're surviving the lack of football for the next few months. How are you going to handle that emotionally? I'm really down. I mean, the only thing that really that gave me any kind of hope whatsoever is that I'm going to carry with me the halftime show for yes. NHL football season. That was amazing. That was, so that, was, good. That, was, that was old school, my generation. Those are my guys. I was like, yes, this is just going to keep me. Anytime I get down, I'm just going to think of that halftime show, and it'll, <laughs> it'll carry me till camp starts at the fall. You'll They'll just hang upside good. down like dollar cent, I mean 50 cent, <laughs> and you'll just trying, when, you know, when, 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 summon uh, that. When Dre went to the piano and then steps away, oh. and those just goes in, like I got the chills yes, from that, you yes. guys. That's, yes. Yeah, that was awesome. It was, it was so, so good. good. And you know what? Snoop can still bring it. Like, yes. come on, he's 50 years old, and he was just bringing it. It was awesome. And Dre <laughs> looks so as good. good as ever. What the heck? Those guys are timeless, right? It's going to yes. be hard to beat. Like, L.A. repping L.A. right there was pretty cool. Those are all the acts that, you know, I realize that M's a, um, Eminem's a, a Detroit kid. But remember, Dre went out and signed him. And, yeah. And so those were, all, those were all Dre guys that he produced. It was, it was pretty cool. And then, and then the game was a fantastic game. And how many times have you know, we watched the Super Bowl when it didn't live up to the billing? And this one lived up to the billing. It's fantastic, and, yes. You know, yeah, the quarterbacks played great, and there was all kinds of drama. And and I love the fact that the Rams down the stretch just said, "Listen, you can take your nine guys, and our nine guys are going to block and just play with those nine guys. And then this is just going to be Matt Stafford throwing it to Cup against double coverage, and, not, and we don't care. We're just going to throw it there, and you see if your two guys can stop him. And bottom line is, they couldn't. It was awesome. Yeah, they it couldn't. Pretty, they couldn't. Blaine. Amazing. They couldn't, they couldn't stop couldn't. Cooper Cup. And he smells like cinnamon. <laughs> and, and, and the, throws that, the, the throws that Matt was making, like, like Cup, first of all, is a ridiculous beast. It didn't He's matter so what good. they did. Finally, so they're just good. like, we're just going to grab the guy and hope they don't call it, right? But but the throws that Stafford was making 
two cup. He was throwing him open against double coverage. I mean, it was it was really fun to watch. And Joe Burrow's it, Joe Burrow's going to be something. I mean, he is going to be he's he's already a special player. So uh, no, that was a great game. So you have a great game, and you have like maybe the best halftime show I've seen. I can't even remember a better halftime show. And and uh, what a great Super Bowl Sunday we had. It was awesome. I mean, you probably got to go back to Michael Jackson. Seriously. For like yeah, a, a comparable exactly. halftime No, you're show. right. It's been that long. You're right on. It's, yeah. it's been that long. So that long. was fun. I, I, I loved it. But then reality sat in about 11 o'clock as I was heading to bed. And I'm like, well, that's it. And now, <laughs> no football. But, 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 then, but, then, but then, I re, then I reminded myself that um, – yeah, what's that music that's like blah blah blah? But um, Debbie Downer. But then I remember, yeah. Then I remembered it was still basketball season, yep. and there's a lot going on with that, and we got a lot to look forward to. So thank goodness, right? Indeed. Thank goodness for basketball. We have a ton to discuss as we push through this February frenzy to a hopeful March Madness inclusion for BYU men's basketball in the NCAA tournament. Blaine, it feels like BYU has to win at St. Mary's to feel comfortable about an at-large spot. I know it not technically, and I heard a few guys over the weekend say, well, BYU doesn't have to win that game, but it sure would help. Where do you stand on it? Does BYU have to win at St. Mary's to feel comfortable about an at-large spot? See, with, with that verbiage that you just used, Spencer, the answer, that's yes. Like, to feel comfortable? Absolutely. And and I feel like if they if they win Saturday, and man, could they have picked a better time? Like they didn't pick it, but could they have scheduled a better time to have a week to prepare this game? The word you use Spencer is to be comfortable, right? And, and the answer to that is absolutely. They have to win to be comfortable. Can they still get in? Yeah. You know, and I expect them to win against Pepperdine and LMU having just played them and now get them at home. They're, they're going to win those two games. I, I feel pretty good about that. They won one without Foose, Right. Um, and, but then they're going to have to go do some work in the, in the conference tournament. Um, and still have an outside chance that they could be excluded. They beat St. Mary's and then down the stretch beat Pepperdine and LMU at home. Then they're in a, they're a really good position at that point because that St. Mary's game pulls a lot of clout in terms of net and all those things that we include in, in that selection process. So it's a huge game. And this timing of having a week to prepare for them, I think is really important. And the reason I say that is I felt like the first time these two teams played, BYU scout on St. Mary's was so on the mark. It was perfection. They, they were in the right spots. They knew who the shooters were. Um, the guys that weren't shooters, they let them catch it out on the perimeter and they hesitated. The guys that were shooters, BYU was right there on the catch. They understood who they had to mark on the perimeter and who they could help off of like no other game this season. And then the bigs inside did a good job of, of cutting off um, the, the drives and cutting off and making the big guys work and pushing them a little bit further away from the basket. They did just enough inside to create problems. And, and, you know, St. Mary's has this great inside out game. A lot of teams in this league rely on their penetration. You come off a ball screen, turn the corner and go really hard downhill on the dribble drive, get in rotations and kick. St. Mary's does some of that, but they also move the ball inside out where they throw it into the post and kick it back out. In that first matchup, BYU was so on and understanding where the ball was going and every shot was contested. And that result was St. Mary shot 29% from the field and 17% from three. That's back when we were saying guys, Hey, BYU is so good defensively. They don't even need to be a great scoring team (laughs) um, to to win games. And that's why we thought that they would finish number two in this league, hands down. And we're really, really prepared for an NCAA tournament run. And, and the last few games, I mean, I look at that Pepperdine game, and, and BYU shoot 64% from the field, 65% from three, and they win by six. And oh, and oh, by the way, they were plus 14 in rebounding margin, and they still only won by six. That's because they couldn't stop Pepperdine. No. 59% from the field, 44%. I mean, it's they've been really struggling to find that magic. Yeah, and it just, I mean, it just got, it got super ugly. It got super ugly taking yes. care of the ball, Blaine. 18 turnovers at Pepperdine as well. Yeah, min- minus nine in turnover margin that Pepperdine game. That's a great equalizer, right? You go out and shoot 64%, you win by 20, don't you? You yeah. can't miss a shot if three. you turn it over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barcelo goes 10 of 12 and scores 33, even though they're doubling him, and you win by six. And so that's a complete reflection on them defensively. In the way they beat St. Mary's the first time around, 
was on the defensive end of the floor. You can't say anything else but that. They have to find that. And I love the fact that they have a whole week to go back, review what they did the first time, watch all of the tape, have a great scout in place, understand what they've got to do defensively. And if they win this game Saturday, it's going to be on the defensive end of the floor. And you watch. When that ball gets kicked out to to St. Mary's shooters, BYU's got to be there on the catch, ready to contest that shot. Um, That's what they did the first time around. That's what they've got to do this time. They get this game Saturday, and they're perfectly capable. Um, then they're in a really, really good position. Then, then that word that you use, Spencer, comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, I feel really good about that comfortable word if they beat St. Mary's Saturday night. And then I would still need BYU to be the three seed and win a semifinal to feel comfortable at that point for me. Because yeah. St. Mary's 21 in net. This would be the best win of the season as uh, we look at the metrics. So the question, Blaine, twofold here is, one, do you feel like BYU can suddenly turn on the defense? And two, if Foose can't play with that groin, um, injury, can they turn on the defense? That, that's the hard part. If, if Foose can, can get back, he and Atiki both have to play well, even if Foose is back. And, and I'm watching Atiki grow up in front of our eyes. Hey, we watched Foose grow up right in front of our eyes early in the season. Um, but they're still young. Still sometimes like Foose will come and he'll be late on a rotation and the other team gets an easy two. Um, and so so not only do those two do, – do you need Foose to play – you need Loner to be really, really good um, and really physical against the St. Mary's team and, and use his quickness to get in position as those bigs are going to make their catch so they're never really comfortable. So, you know, we don't, we don't talk about Loner defensively that much. And, and, you know, he finally had a breakout game offensively where I just loved his aggression, uh, you know, this, this last weekend. Um, but really, he's got to play lights out defense. This is a big basketball team. And, and you need all three of those guys. And if you don't have Foose, then that's even more pressure on Atiki to be phenomenal and be able to stay on the floor and guard without fouling. And then Loner has got to play so far above his head defensively and just be a beast inside if they're going to have any chance if Foose doesn't play. Blaine, before you go, I want to ask you about something that we saw from T. John Lucas. Uh, I believe he was the one to initially tweet this out, but he sent out a picture that showed five starters for BYU basketball None of those five members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and four minorities. And he said, we're changing the culture at BYU. What do you think of seeing a picture like that and a starting five like that, we believe, for the first time ever in the history of BYU basketball? Yeah, I think, I think it's awesome. And, and the thing that's most important about that is that, that you guys and I, you know, we know all of these guys, right? So we get to be a little closer than, than most and, and it's not just that there's diversity on the roster because it, it's, it's not just um, you know, people of color and, and people of different re- religions, but they're from all over the globe, right? So there's all of these cultures, but there is one common thread. They're all very comfortable with the culture of BYU. And, and Mark and his staff have done a great job. You know, you, you've got two active Muslim um, players on this team that very, feel very comfortable and, uh, and a, an environment that that talks about religion and talks about faith. And so all, all of these players on this team buy into this. I want to be at a faith-based institution. It doesn't matter whether I'm Catholic or Protestant or a member of the Church of Jesus Christ or Latter-day Saints or Muslim. They all have this common thread that they want to be at a faith-based institution. They want to play at a high level. Um, to me, that's the coolest thing of all, is that that all of this diversity – melds and there's this common thread that holds these guys together um i think it's really cool and i think it's awesome and i think it makes a huge statement um that if if mark and his staff go out and they're careful and pick the right guys that believe in that common culture you can have phenomenal diversity and represent the globe with byu athletics i I think it's awesome amen to that blaine great stuff uh, let's hope that uh, BYU, while they are changing the culture, they can change their current trend and get into the NCAA tournament with a big win at St. Mary's. Uh, what You know the culture I want to see come back? The culture in the first St. Mary's game, which was you are not going to get an uncontested shot. Yeah. We play lights out defense. Deal with that. That's what I want to see on Saturday night. Love it. Let's go. Thanks, Blaine. All right, guys. Talk to you soon. Blaine Fowler with us on BYU Sports Nation, dual threat analyst, uh, and he brings up some great points. Defend like crazy. And then to back to what we were talking about, just value possession. Take care of the ball. If BYU can do those two things, they have a good shot, right? Yes. 
it's been a minute, and BYU's gone through some stuff. Uh, hopefully they can leverage that into the best performance they could possibly have in the biggest game of the season up to this point. Hopefully that includes Saturday night. Foos. Yeah, seriously. No, they need him. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Jerem, BYU football has long been known to produce the most popular man on campus, and typically it is the backup quarterback. Yes. <laughs> right now, it would appear, as Aaron Roderick told us last week with Baylor Romney now officially out, that Jacob Conover is that guy. Does he step into the role as the most popular guy on campus? He's the backup quarterback behind Jaron Hall. More importantly, does BYU have the quarterback depth necessary with Jaron Hall, Jacob Conover, Soljay Maiava, Peters, and Cade Fennigan to win 10-plus games again? Are there enough quarterbacks in that room with enough experience that if Jaron Hall goes down, BYU's going to be okay? They're going to win 10-plus again. Even if Jaron starts every game, 10-plus still feels like a stretch. It's just a really hard schedule. So um, if, if you're saying, okay, you got to get at least nine in the regular season, are there, are there three losses among this group? Baylor, at Oregon, Notre Dame, Arkansas, Arkansas, at Boise State, and then Utah State got way better at the end of the season. Who knows? Yeah, there are probably three losses there. Um, but, yeah, could you get to nine? That'd be pretty good. That'd be really good. Like, can BYU overachieve again? Without Tyler Algier, it feels like it might be more of a challenge. Hopefully, BYU, the sum of the parts can offensively equal similar production. I'm not talking rushing yards. I'm just talking, like, efficient. can Jaron Hall be the same kind of efficient? Sure. Can Christopher Brooks come in and do some nice things behind that offensive line? He won't be a 1,600-yard guy, we don't think. But can it be a thousand yard guy? Oh, I'd be amazing. Or a twelve hundred yard guy, or something, right? Can the defense be as opportunistic as they were, and can the offense not turn it over? Can you? The chances are that's going to be hard, right? But hopefully, BYU continues to evolve. The program gets better. Hopefully, the O lines as dominant as we're hoping they are. Da da da. The, but the reality is that Jaron Hall has missed several starts in in two different years, right? Based on he had two concussions. Yes, he missed all of twenty twenty with the hip. This last year, you know, he, he had uh, an injury as well that prevented him from, uh, you know, a couple of games. So it, it's – and honestly, I, I'm not picking on Jaron. Generally speaking, the, I, I wish I knew the number. I don't. Is you're going to start two different quarterbacks in a season. Like, almost everyone does. Even Georgia did. You know what I mean? Like, and there were injuries and an aptitude, the two eyes sometimes, right? So the, the chances of that happening are not high, which brings us to the stat of the day. Ooh. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. In 11 seasons of independence now, BYU's had two seasons where one quarterback started every game. 2013 Taysom Mill, 2020 Zach Wilson, okay? which is incredible. So chances are you're going to start multiple guys. To me, it's not about who's there. Like, Jaron Hall had a tremendous year. I'm very excited. Jacob Connor, we think he can be a baller when he gets the chance, right? And then we don't know much about everyone behind that. Kate Fennigan, we've seen play against BYU. Thrown in there. He was technically the fourth stringer, third stringer that day, but fourth stringer on the depth chart. Sol J. Maiavi, you mentioned. And then, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. But, yeah, 10, listen, I don't care how you slice it. Yeah. If BYU got nine in the regular season, tremendous. It's clearly a lot to ask expecting BYU to win 10 games next year. And to your point, even if Jaron Hall starts every game, to me that's the key is keeping him healthy. Like BYU winning 10 games, they probably need Jaron Hall to be the starter in every game. To have that shot. Yes. Yes. Agreed. That, that's what it feels like. And even then, it's a, it's a big ask. That's not saying that the guys behind him can't come in. And it's all situational. Like, if if Jaron can't play against Dixie State, or will it be Utah Tech? In the Utah fall? Tech, yeah. So it will be the Utah Tech. Live on BYU okay. TV, Spence. Don't forget. Okay. Don't forget. You know what? BYU could probably win that game without Jaron Hall playing. Or 
East Carolina's got to come all the way to Provo. Yeah, Jacob Conover, Kate Bennigan, Soljay Mayava Peters, BYU offense, Aaron Roderick. They could probably figure it out against some of the lower tier group of five teams. There just aren't that many. We got 2017 payback, by the way, with East Carolina. Carolina. (laughs) I know. I know. We haven't forgotten. I'll never forget that road trip. (laughs) That was rough. That was rough. But, yeah, so it's situational. But if, if BYU is having to start a backup quarterback against some of the power fives or multiple power fives, uh, it just feels like good night to the idea of 10-plus wins. Jaron Hall staying healthy and maybe handing the ball off more and doing some things to try and keep himself healthy, great. Um, but he, here's the thing with Jaron. This is, this is a tough balance because – he knows he's got the injury history, but yet we want him to play like he hasn't been injured. Like to a degree, go right? Go out and p- don't worry about it. Just do your thing. Be an athlete. That's a difficult balance to handle mentally for him. Yes, and it didn't help that he broke a rib in game one. And played pe- through it. A lot of people have talked about, yeah, against Arizona State. He beat when the, Utah when the guy landed with hurt ribs. It, it, yes. No one knew. He just played through it. He's a tough cookie, right? So that's awesome that he could play through that. But he wasn't, like, the same dude per se, right? He was throwing really effectively despite that, but he couldn't be the runner that beat Utah, right? Yeah. I don't think BYU beats Baylor last year, but if Jaron Hall is healthy and can run against Boise State, who knows? That was a fumble situation. But, yeah, it's Jacob Conover's backup job to lose now with no Baylor Romney. It was pretty good, man. 5-1 and one as a starter. G5 killer. He is the guy. G5 killer, man. <laughs> he was good. Be- BYU. Beat Boise State in 2019, who was number 14. BYU's 2-4 and four at the time. That's one of the biggest wins that's happened in recent history for BYU. And Baylor Romney was the guy that night as a freshman. Baylor's one of the – He's he might be – like if we if we list like the the best backup quarterbacks in BYU history. Well, are we doing like young and eighty? Yeah. How do you how do you one? quantify that? Like <laughs> <laughs> Jim McMahon in seventy eight nine yeah, redshirting. Does yeah. BYU have the quarterback depth necessary to win ten plus games again? It's probably going to be a scenario where they have to start at least two. That's just the percentages say that's what's going to happen. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Earlier this morning, Jerem had the opportunity to speak with the big woman on campus, and not just BYU's campus, like the United States Women's National Team campus. She's crushing it, and she had a great year last year. Here's my conversation with the one and only Ashley Hatch. Ashley, it has been a minute. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Not as good as you, though, uh, because 2021 (laughs) seemed like perhaps the greatest year of your life. Uh, What was it like? Because you led the NWSL in goals with Golden Boot. You make the national team. You're scoring goals. It's a pretty good year, right? Yeah, I would say it's definitely up there in my uh, soccer career for sure. <laughs> what was it like to get that opportunity? Because we saw you at BYU and you were an amazing player, but it's taken a couple of years. You've had to really navigate, uh, you know, injuries and opportunities to get to this point. So, what what was that journey like to to get to the point where you're scoring for the U.S. <laughs> um it's definitely a long journey um lots of ups and downs but just you know consistent hard work just doing what I can within my sphere of influence and just you know taking the opportunities when they present themselves so uh like you said a long road but excited that it's going down this way let's talk uh club so Washington Spirit you guys win the NWSL you you're the golden boot uh winner with all the all the mo- the most goals in the league what was that experience like to have an individual accomplishment like that, but also the team accomplishment? Um, it was, I don't know, quite amazing. It's hard to explain. Um, being able to win the championship um, with my team, especially through like a tough year. Um, I don't know. It was just, like I said, it's really hard to explain. One of my 
um, favorite moments in my career so far is being able to lift that trophy with my team. Um, and then also to be able to have an individual accomplishment of getting um, golden boot within the same year. Um, I don't know. It's just, it was awesome. <laughs> Given the off the field issues, concerns, struggles that were, were real and real challenging, what did it mean to, at the end of the day, be able to win and sort of validate the hard work in spite of those hard things? It meant a lot. It meant just like that, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the players. And we kind of proved that, that no matter what's going on around us, we can come together and pretty much conquer anything. And so it, it was a little bit extra special to be able to do that with, with this group. And this year, there was some question as to whether you'd be playing and how quickly. Um, you know, for those who haven't followed the story with the league, tell us about kind of what got done and now you're going to be able to play, which is great. Yeah, so we finally um, solidified our first ever uh, collective bargaining agreement as a league, which is huge. So us as players have a lot more rights uh, moving forward and we have a lot more structure and that, well, that's really exciting because that means the longevity of the league is promising and so our NWSL Players Association put in a ton of work over the off season and just grinded it out and got it done before season because if it didn't get done we'd probably have a little bit delay to our season so so it's huge for us. Can you talk to Major League Baseball about this? I would like spring training to start here soon. <laughs> Can you guys help with that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a tough process, so hopefully they can figure it out. <laughs> so tell us what's going well with the league, the domestic United States League here, NWSL, and tell us where it needs to go, in your opinion. Um, well, well, what's going well is the players. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of really talented um, hardworking players and so we added two new teams in California this season which I'm excited about LA and San Diego um, it, it needs to continue to grow and we need to continue to um, expand exposure we need more people watching we need more viewership um, that'll definitely help you know with sponsorships with you know with money there's lots that um continue that needs to continue to improve but it is improving so it's good to see that it's moving that direction we're already adding two new teams in one year which i think will be very solid teams so if we can continue to do that year by year i think that will help a lot absolutely we're talking to ashley hatch on BYU sports nation let's talk about what happened after the club season for you so club and then country you've been with the united states before and debuted in sandy which was super cool, but now you actually got to start and play against Australia, and you score 24 seconds into a game and then three minutes into the other game. What was that experience like? Um, it was an unreal experience to go from winning a championship and then hopping on a plane the next day to fly out to Australia. It was, it was wild, but to be able to get the start and then help the team finish a pretty early goal was exciting and it was just exciting. Like it made me want more, you know, to be able to play with a team that's so competitive and, you know, the style of play is like ruthless so we can get opportunities that early. So it was just exciting. And I hope that I can continue to um, be available for this team. Have you scored a faster goal than 24 seconds? <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty fast. It's pretty good. Well, yeah. You certainly belong among that group. But did you have a moment, and maybe it was in your previous stint in camp with the U.S. a couple of years ago, where you were like, whoa, what am I doing here? Did you have a moment like that? <laughs> I mean, I think definitely my first ever camp when I was still in college at BYU, I was just like, wow, like, I've been watching these girls play on TV forever. Like, these girls are legends. So um, I've definitely had those moments of like, I've got, you know, a long way to go. I've got lots more to experience to get on the same level as these girls. Um, but now I definitely feel like I have a little bit more experience under my belt and I feel a bit more comfortable among all these players. <laughs> You're in camp right now, uh, getting ready to play some matches this week, Thursday night against the Czech Republic, Sunday against New Zealand. What's this camp been like now that you're a seasoned vet with the USA Women's National Team? <laughs> I don't know if I feel comfortable saying a seasoned <laughs> vet yet, but um, it's definitely exciting. Like I've, I've said time and time again, it's always an honor to be in this environment. Um, it's constantly pushing me to learn more, to do better, to improve um, so many different areas in my game, and then to be able to 
play among all the other best players in the league. Um, it's really fun to be on their team. Um, so I'm excited. This camp has been great. I'm like I said, I'm continually I'm continually learning more and more about the game because the coaching staff is just brilliant. So um, I'm enjoying it a lot. Tell us about the the NWSL and overseas soccer as it pertains to uh, the women's game because uh, Michelle Vasconcelos is with Sevilla on loan in Spain. Mm -hmm. There are other leagues out there, right? So what's what's the best fit in terms of, uh, you know, staying in the U.S. versus perhaps going overseas to other leagues that are growing? Granted, the USA has been big mm -hmm. on women's soccer for a long time. Yeah, um, there are lots of options to play overseas. And like you, like you said, Michelle went overseas and it seems like she's doing great and loving it, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, each league, each opportunity is different for everyone because of this new CBA, hopefully we'll be able to keep more players <laughs> in our league and they won't have to go overseas to find an opportunity. Um, but yeah, it's, there's different leagues, different divisions, different levels. Um, obviously like the European side of the women's game is really good. And maybe one day I'd love to try a stint over there, um, but it's also super competitive. Um, and it's also hard for those players to come over here and play in our league because we only have so many international spots and it's just a different style of soccer. So um, it's really exciting that it's grow like women's soccer is growing all over the world and there's opportunities for us to play all over the world. This last year, how much were you able to catch the BYU women's soccer run to the national championship game? <laughs> I watched as much as I could. It was it was pretty exciting. I definitely watched um, the semi and the final, so it was it was fun to watch them. And there's two players from that team who will join you in the league, which is exciting. Michaela Coulihan with the Orlando Pride, and then Cameron Tucker with Gotham FC, which is like the coolest name of any club like in the whole world. <laughs> so cool. Um, for how good BYU's been in women's soccer, there's been a handful, right, that have made it professionally. I'm excited to see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more in the league. I think that's going to be fun for the program. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm excited, too. And if you've seen our Challenge Cup schedule, I get to play both Michaela and Cam, uh, both their teams early in the season. So I'm excited to play against them and also see how they do in the league. I think they'll do great. Does that mean we're going to have, like, a jersey swap photo at some point with both? <laughs> That would actually be pretty cool. Maybe we will. <laughs> yeah, we need like the hallway littered with uh, all the jerseys from all of you uh, in the women's yeah. soccer offices. I think that'd be pretty good, right? Yeah, we got to get that going. <laughs> Ashley, it was cool for Jan uh, Rockwood to finally get that final four. Um, that was the only thing missing from mm -hmm. her resume. And she's been the program, the only coach. What did it mean to you as yeah. a former player to see that happen for her? Oh, it was awesome. I mean, she's worked so hard and she puts everything she has into every single team. Um, so to be able to watch her, you know, have that success that she did this year was just really exciting and very well deserved. And I'm excited now that she's been there. She knows, you know, what it's like and what it takes. So hopefully she can continue to take the program there every year. Over the weekend, we were talking about Alex Barcelo went for 33 on the men's basketball team. Arizona kid, Shaley Gonzalez went for 35, Arizona kid, Arizona kid. You, the the Arizona-BYU connection is a strong one, is it not? Yes, it is. That's pretty awesome. Okay, well, Ashley, uh, congratulations on all the success. Thanks for the time, and uh, good luck Thursday night against the Czech Republic. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Ashley Hatch on BYU Sports Nation. I know we've talked to her twice in the past six weeks. I want to talk to her like every week now because this she's is great. incredible what she's doing. Yeah, she's fantastic, and she's taken off. She's actually become a better pro than she even was at BYU, and she was awesome here. So that's the goal is that you go to the next level and you get even better, which has been we, – we always wondered, why is she getting looks from the USA national team? But it took a couple years, and then now she's a, a part of the forwards there. There's like six forwards. You have to crack the top six in the country. It's pretty crazy. It's amazing. And that's yeah. the best team in the world, Jerem. Mm -hmm. The best team in the world. Although they have lost a little more recently than usual. <sighs> so it, But it's like, it's tough competition in yeah. the world. Everybody's Ash good. Ashley Hatch is on a team, on a roster, that Megan Rapino and Alex Morgan did not make. Yeah. Think about that. They're getting old. Yes. Slash, they're like, just the tell new age. Uh, slash, they're like, just let us know when the World Cup's cold. <laughs> 
the best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Okay, no men's hoops games tonight. All prep is going into Saturday against St. Mary's in Moraga. Lately, it's been about offense for BYU Day, but when the Cougars beat St. Mary's at home, what feels like a million years ago, it was 52-43, to absolutely defensive. So, how will the Cougars have to do it this time around? Is it offense or is it defense? I think you have to go back to what worked before, which worked in the first 17 wins of the season, which was defense, which they haven't played lately. Um, and and that's, I think that's everything for them. They start with defense and rebounding, and then the offense comes. Uh, they've, they've played horrible defense the last couple of games out, and the offense had to bail them out, and it did. But when you're on the road, you know, as Steve Fisher used to always say from San Diego State, defense, you pack your defense, it travels. It travels. And, yeah. and a lot of times your shot does not. But if you can defend, you're in the game with a chance. And that's what St. Mary's does at home. They, they take the air out of the ball. It becomes an ugly game, much like it was up here when BYU beat them 52-43. to 43. The Gales were just 4 of 23 from the three-point line, 29% overall. This is not a bad shooting team, but it was a bad shooting team that night. BYU didn't shoot great either, just 1 of 13 from three. But those 19 forced turnovers were the difference in the Cougars, one of their biggest wins of the season. Now, if they can do that again, and at St. Mary's, oh, they're going to miss 45. See that nice block? That was sweet. Uh, at, they are going to miss If they can yeah. do that again against St. Mary's, it'll forgive them of a few sins. And, um, and it's really not about whether they're going to take fourth or fifth or third in the WCC. You beat St. Mary's, and you're back up in the polls that matter, which is the net and the, and the others that project you into the tournament a little higher than just the last guy in. Yep. But if they don't play defense, St. Mary's probably not going to shoot four of 23 from three at home. So you got to yep. play defense, yep. or uh, or it could get ugly real fast. Hundred percent. And we talked about this earlier in the week uh, with Spencer Johnson. Here's what he had to say when I asked him: Do you feel like you can snap back into that same kind of defensive team you were? Yeah, we've been t- we've been watching a ton of film. They got us in there, you know, watching this clip, watching this guy. Um, how did our defense look on on this possession? On this possession, what are we going to do here? And. I mean, you guys watched that game. What did they go, like 12 minutes without scoring? Yeah, yeah it was it was like a that? stupid amount. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. So, you know, that's going to be really hard to re- to repeat, but um, definitely, definitely doable. That's the hope is that BYU can become that team again because the last six games, BYU has allowed 70-plus. BYU 6-7 and seven when giving up 70-plus. And then when BYU gives up 76-plus, that's kind of been a weird number, 2-5. and five. BYU was 0-5. Oh until the last two games where it still won. Now, BYU's not playing LMU and Pepperdine this no. week. That's the bad news. Um, the good news is BYU can watch that film and be like, okay, this worked that time. Perhaps it can work again. I do fear that without Foos, though, you're already down to your third string, you know, number five at that point, right? Um, that, that will be a bigger challenge where BYU would have to overcome no Foos on defense with more offense. I, I think that perhaps... There needs to be, uh, you know, 52 points worth of offense <laughs> was enough to win by nine. I don't think that will be the case in this matchup. Um, so BYU's got to play good D. But I think the, the discovery of the team that put up, you know, 1.26 and 1.32 points per possession the last two games, those are the top two D1 offensive rated games of the season. A semblance of that offensive group needs to show up in Moraga because I don't think that without Foos, we're hoping Foose plays. If he doesn't, I don't think BYU can do what it did at home. It's just going to be hard to be like, hey, Atiki, can you do all that Need again? you to be a senior. Right? Need you to be a senior. It's going to be tough. So, uh, obviously, it's a combination. But I think BYU's got to play way better offense. Hey, St. Mary's went into Santa Clara last week and got beat, just like BYU did. They, they're very similar, these two teams, only yep. they're taller. And uh, rebounding and defense, I agree with you, is going to be the key on Saturday. All right, here's the next one. March Madness. Is it March Madness or bust for this basketball team? It's a good question because at what point this team was ranked 12th and like a four seed kind of type of team. So do we readjust expectations based on injuries and the reality? The program the last two years has made the tournament or would have made the tournament. So the expectation from Mark Pope is that they make it. And given what happened early in the season and BYU's been in the whole time until perhaps the end, maybe they're not. We hope they are. 
the NIT is probably a bust for this team. I think they, I think that the fan base needs to uh, see an NCAA tournament. But given the injuries, Dave, it's hard to expect and call it a bust given how well this team played without uh, Richard Harward and Gavin Baxter and perhaps Foose at the end a little bit here. Bust sounds like it was just worthless and garbage. Right. No, this team's good. Um, it just wouldn't be up to probably the standard, but bust is probably too strong a word there. Here's the, uh, here's the thought. Look at all the great BYU teams and then eliminate their front line. Do they get to the NCAA tournament? Does Danny Ainge get to the NCAA tournament if Greg Kite's out, Fred Roberts is out, and Steve Trumbo's out? Does Jimmer get to the big dance without Brandon Davies, no heart sock, and... Uh, uh, Logan Magnuson or somebody. So I think, I think reality... Reality is, uh, reality is just sitting right there going, hey, look, this was an NCAA tournament team. It can be if it wins Saturday and, and finish strong. But if it's not, it makes perfect sense to understand what happened and why they're not because of the front line of Harward, Baxter, and now Foose at a very critical time of the season to be out. And uh, you, you can't get to the show without a front line. So, man, Saturday's huge. Hope they can play better than they are on Saturday. Yes, which BYU was. We can now clearly see that BYU, to its credit, was overachieving without Gavin Baxter and Richard Harvard. It was incredible what they were doing with two freshmen from a different continent, from a different religion, like all the -the off-the-court stuff that they were able to manage effectively and still have to some degree, right? And then Alex Barcelo cranked it up a notch on Saturday when BYU needed it, which was great. They got it done on the road in overtime against LMU. It's like, okay, but that version of that team is an attorney team. No. A attorney team doesn't go to LMU and Pepperdine and barely win, right? right. They, they go and dominate. Okay, which brings us to the resume update. Ned is the same at 53. Ken Palm's 53. These are not numbers of teams that make the attorney, by the way. You always hanging on by a thread, okay? You always got to climb into like the mid-40s here. If they beat St. Mary's on Saturday, perhaps they get a, a big booster. St. Mary's, by the way, recently 21 in net. This would be the best win of the year if BYU gets it. Team rankings, a 1.2% better chance. I don't know why. I don't even know if I care. Awesome. 19%. Still a 12 seed in bracketology. So, huge game coming up Saturday. No game today. Um, but you know what it is today? San Francisco against St. Mary's. Right. San Francisco was up 23 against the Gales and lost. It's the second largest comeback in the WCC to BYU's comeback against Iona in the first four. See, I, I, would, I wouldn't mind St. Mary's winning this tonight and getting worn out because Amen. really all that matters is that BYU beats them on Saturday. It, yes. Again, it's not about, hey, who's going to be second? Who's going to be playing Saturday or Monday in the tournament as far as getting into the big dance? It's... Um, you know, maybe triple overtime, you know, something where, <laughs> where St. Awesome. Mary's is worn out and then BYU comes in with fresh legs. It's a big break for BYU to not have anybody tonight Yep, because of, of Saturday. And it's Saturday's that big. It's a huge game. Arkansas is reportedly set to remain on BYU's 2023 schedule with that game being moved to September 16th. We also see that BYU features a home game, a return game for their trip to Knoxville a few years back with Tennessee. So, Jaron, with Arkansas staying on the schedule, should BYU keep Tennessee on the schedule and then potentially maybe add nine Big 12 games so that BYU is playing as many as 11 Power Fives? Yeah, so we threw up a graphic right now that says 2023 football schedule. This is what BYU has scheduled. They're going to need to cancel all but three or four of these, right? Arkansas feels like it's confirmed based on the report. BYU, you'd imagine, would have an FCS team. Um, And then your question about Tennessee. The rest probably have to be canceled unless you're playing only eight conferences. Central Florida will be canceled because that's a conference game. Potentially. We don't know that. We'll see. Um, Because they could be in, like, another division or whatever and maybe don't play them. Um, Okay, should BYU keep Tennessee? Oh, it's really hard not to keep a home game against Tennessee. But let's say BYU is only playing eight and not nine conference games. They still have to decide that. We'll talk to Bob Bowlesby about like that. what are they thinking there, and, and when will they figure that out. If you play eight Big 12 games, and you have Arkansas, and you have Tennessee, you have 10. <laughs> this is what you have always wanted, Jerry. I've always – well, I've wanted 12. You know that. 
and a bowl game. This is the closest to 12 or 13 Power 5 games of the I season really you have come. I really wanted to see if BYU yeah. could go 3-9 and nine a year. No. I, <laughs> I can't. You can't pass up a Tennessee home game. You just can't. No. Keep it you on the schedule. You have to keep that game. Yes. Now, let's talk about the rest of that. Um, so you agree, Tennessee, you got to keep Yeah, you keep yeah. the Tennessee keep game. It. People okay. are like, well, why? Why is BYU playing at Arkansas? Why wouldn't they get rid of that game? Listen, yeah. Arkansas is coming to Provo this season. BYU is an amazing partner in this stuff. Like, BYU will go to Georgia Southern in Independence. You know what I mean? Like, BYU go to Middle Tennessee. BYU is an amazing partner in that. Okay? They're going to Liberty, right? Crazy. Um, so, yeah, Arkansas, yeah, is coming here this year. So, BYU's like, yes, we will yeah, return the BYU's game. BYU's going to fulfill yes. their part of that agreement. BYU's the anti-Notre Dame. Yeah. They'll actually go. No, well, now, Notre Dame is playing a game. I'm, that was a cheap shot. You're right. They are playing a game in Vegas. But, okay, 10 Power 5 is a lot. It might be 11 if it's nine conference games, dude. And what the Big 12 traditionally does is the first three weeks is non-con. Then you go conference after that. So, you would have Tennessee as the opener. FCS on September 9th, I imagine, at home. At Arkansas, and then and then if if it's nine games, that's your non-con. If it's not, maybe you maybe you can figure something out with Utah State there on Friday the 29th. That would still work out. I don't know if Utah State's already scheduled a game there because that date is TBD TBA, but obviously conference weekend with whatnot. So we'll see. But the, BYU will play a minimum of nine or ten, depending on what conference is, and it might be eleven if you keep Tennessee. So it, it could be interesting. At that point, let's just talk about it. Let's just say it right now. The, the goal at that point is to just make a bowl game. You're not competing for a conference championship with that schedule. You are, try, you are trying to go to a bowl game in year one. <laughs> let's be realistic about this. Go to a bowl game. It's very exciting. And in the words of Mark Pope, it's also terrifying. No, it is. Like, and think about what BYU crazy. will be doing at the quarterback position in 2023. If Jaron Hall has a great 2022, decides to leave for the NFL, now you're facing, let's say, 10 Power 5 teams with a new guy, a new quarterback. Is that Jacob Conover? Is that somebody else? Is that transfer portal? What Whoa. is that? Yeah, what is that? Or does so, Jaron Hall stay and he's the guy that leads BYU into the Big 12? Maybe he does. I would imagine if he has another good year like this, that he might bounce. There's a, there's a strong chance that could happen. Okay. Strong chance. But, like, Gunnar Romney came back, but he got hurt. You don't want Jaron to get hurt. You don't want any of that. Okay, topic two. Which basketball team has more on the line tomorrow, Spence? The BYU men at St. Mary's or the BYU women hosting Gonzaga? So because I am of the opinion that BYU men's basketball, and I know a lot of you think I'm crazy for this. Hey, Spencer, put on your blue goggles. I just think you're crazy, period. Hey. What about this? Blue goggle alert. Blue goggle well aware of that, too. <laughs> blue goggle okay. alert. But I'm going to take goggle out alert. the blue goggles because, listen. Oh. I am of the opinion that the BYU men can still make the NCAA tournament and lose to St. Mary's. St. Mary's is projected as a seven seed right now. BYU has like a 13% chance to win that game according to ESPN's Basketball Power Index. So while it would be incredible for BYU to win, and it certainly would help them feel more comfortable about getting an at-large, it is not, in my opinion, mandatory for BYU to beat the Gales tomorrow. It's not, hey, if you don't win tomorrow, you have no shot of getting into the NCAA tournament as an at-large. Here's why. San Francisco just lost to St. Mary's last night, which means BYU, even with the loss to St. Mary's tomorrow, is pacing for a quarterfinal showdown with San Francisco in Las Vegas. I need the Ken Palm adjusted win percentage to know that. Right now, it feels like that's what it will be. There it we'll is. see. There it is. We'll see. Yeah. I, I need to see that to feel more con- – like, right now, I don't know. Like, is BYU the five? I have no idea. If BYU plays San Francisco in Las Vegas in that quarterfinal, yeah. the winner of that game, Jerem, is going to get the final spot from the West Coast Conference as an at-large. The loser is going to be on the outside looking in because San Francisco, after their loss to St. Mary's, is creeping closer and closer to being on the outside looking in. Because four aren't going, no. like I said from okay. Ma- Yeah, four maybe. Aren't, four aren't Maybe going. it's three. If three BYU, would be nice. If BYU beats St. Mary's tomorrow and then San Francisco somehow beats Gonzaga, then yeah, okay, four right. are going to get in. Right. Four are going to get in. But say that sentence loud and don't I lie. know. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not of the opinion that BYU so needs to win maybe. tomorrow. 
If they get San Francisco and Vegas and they win that game, then the winner of that game would have won two of three in the season series, and that team will be the third and final WCC team in as an at-large. So, with that, all that said, to me it's women's basketball, Jaron, because they are playing for a conference championship. If they lose to Gonzaga tomorrow, somehow, amazingly, this incredible team would not win their own conference. Well, they could do that in Vegas, Spence. That's why I think it's the men. Ah, um, see, and, regular and, season and, and feels what, bigger to me. What the... I agree, but it's not perceived that way. Like, the regular season title is never applauded the way the tournament title is. It's so weird to me. The women are going to play an 18-team tournament, 18-game tournament. In the regular season. And win, and it doesn't matter compared to the tur- – the, it's just for seeding. But it is for the NCAA tournament stuff. I think it's the men because if they don't win that, it's going to be hard to make the turn. And hopefully they still do if they lose. And hopefully Foose can play, or if Foose can't play, they can somehow figure it out on the defensive end. But – Yesterday, Dave and I were talking about, hey, you need more offense. I think it's the men because if BYU doesn't make the tourney after being ranked 12th, I know a lot of injuries. Have happened. That's just disappointing. It, it, it is. Certainly. Yeah. Now, also for consideration with the women, 29-game home winning streak, regular season de facto championship, and they are battling to be a top four seed in the NCAA tournament. If they lose to Gonzaga tomorrow, you can kiss any chance at a top four seed goodbye. That will not happen. The NCAA is looking for any reason to not put BYU in a position where they could, quote-unquote, host or be considered to host or have to go through that whole process. If BYU is a five or six with the women, I'm happy. I'm good. They've got to be Gonzaga I, I like tomorrow. To, to be higher than six if they're like 20, uh, you know, five and two or whatever. If BYU doesn't beat Gonzaga tomorrow, it is conceivable that they could be a six or, yikes, seven seed, depending on what happens in the conference tournament, too. They got to win this game tomorrow. It's a huge game. All right. They can get him back in Vegas. Our question of the day. (laughs) This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. The commissioner of the Big 12 Conference, Bob Bowlesby. We told you we'd keep a seat warm for you whenever you came into town after that Zoom conference back in September, and here you are. Well, a lot of the seats that I sit in have wires hooked to them, so this is <laughs> this is more comfortable than that. How would you explain your trip to Provo thus far? I know it's been a quick one, but how has it been? Well, we have our entire senior team with us here, and uh, it's been a terrific visit. Uh, uh, Tom Homo and his team have done a great job, and and uh, President Worthen has been gracious with his time. And we've just uh, we've met a lot of great people. We've met uh, and spent time with a lot of the coaches. Uh, the the highlight has been meeting some of the student athletes and and just getting a feel for the place. And so uh, we just couldn't be any more excited about BYU being our new partner. And uh, I can't wait till July first of twenty three. We cannot either, and when the announcement happened, I thought, well, I want this to be a year out, not two, but it feels like there's a lot to figure out, and you guys are right now. Yeah, there really is a lot in transition, and, and some of it is check boxes, and some of it is just comparing notes to make sure that, uh, that we're doing the same things that uh, that uh, you're doing here, and, and that the expectations meet the, the actual output, and so it, it's just, uh, there's a period of transition, and, and I think that uh, BYU leadership was also intent upon um, making sure that there was a smooth transition from the WCC and not unduly uh, disadvantaging them. And yeah. so having having some lead time is a blessing. There isn't any doubt about that. But there's uh, plenty to do. We have we have subgroups working on scheduling, and we're beginning to include uh, BYU leadership in in our meetings. And uh, and so uh, it's uh, it's starting to feel real. Yeah. We're looking forward to it for sure. Uh, You are a renaissance man in your responsibilities within the Big 12 and the NCAA in general. You're a huge part of the College Football Playoff Expansion Committee. We just learned this morning that it's going to stay at four teams through 2025. How do you feel about the decision to stay at four teams in the College Football Playoff through 25? Well, I was a part of uh, the decision, so I have to take some of the responsibility for it. Uh, I actually believe that – 
the move to 12 was um, was altogether appropriate. Uh, it was good for us competitively. It was good for us financially. And we expected that we might be able to do that in the years 11 and 12. And, and uh, I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to do that. Um, there are those who think that uh, this sort of major change uh, is ill-timed because of all the other challenges we're facing in intercollegiate athletics. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, we are not looking at a period of calm water any time in the near future. And the fact is, uh, when the playoff gets over in year 12, uh, the 25-26 season, uh, 26 championship game, uh, we're going to have to make these decisions. And so in some ways we've kicked the can down the road, and, and I'm disappointed at that because I thought there was some opportunity. So I, I'm I'm not happy with the way it's turned out. But, uh, you know, we, we manage the playoff by unanimous consent, and that comes with its burdens. And so uh, we will we will continue to forge ahead. And, and I, I continue to believe that 12 is the right format. Uh, I think it, it creates the right sense of opportunity for everybody that's playing college football. Uh, I think it's also good for the Big 12 Conference. And so um, I, I am going to continue to push in that direction. Yeah, I was hoping for 12 too. So I'm looking forward to hopefully one day <laughs> that it is 12. Um, I, I know there were some meetings in Las Vegas a couple months ago where you guys started to discuss some of the things with the new league. Um, when do you when do you kind of finalize that in terms of how many conference games you're going to have and division splits and that kind of thing? Well, we've got the subcommittee that's working on uh, football scheduling, one that's working on men's basketball, one that's working on women's basketball, baseball, um, all of those kinds of things. And, and uh, we're, we're making good progress. I, I think that uh, we one of the things we're doing is we're beginning to include the athletic directors and the coaches in our meetings going forward. And so um, they'll start to feel like a part of the Big 12 and, and a part of the decision processes on, on those kinds of things. But but, you know, there's there's also a transition that takes place in how eligibility is certified and, and what kinds of records we expect and what the policies are by which we manage the league. And so there's a um, there's going to be a period of adjustment. There isn't any doubt about it. But um, by the time uh, we get to this point in the year next year. I, I think BYU and the other three incoming members will feel like members of our league, even though they aren't competing at that time. And then before long, it'll be July 1st, and uh, we'll be off to the races. It'll be here before we know it, really. Um, do you have an opinion on eight or nine conference games? Because that certainly shapes uh, a team's schedule in a great way. I, I'm uh, in, in football, I'm an advocate for nine games because I, quali- I think our conference quality is – is good enough that that's a that's a valuable thing for us. I, I think you know we're going to be at 14 for a couple of years, and and so uh, playing a full uh, round robin is not in the cards. And uh, so I, I think you want to minimize the number of no plays you have if you possibly can. I think I think that's one of the things that make great leagues is great rivalries. And uh, so. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to have that happen. Once once we get to 12, uh, we'll probably take a different look at it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we played divisions in, in football. Um, I'm I'm guessing that we may may not play divisions in basketball for, for different reasons. But um, those things are still taking shape. And I, I honestly don't have any preconceived notions that – um, that those are any place close to final. I, I, I think we are in that process where we're listening and we're we're talking to both the current members uh, and the continuing members as well as the incoming members, and and we'll eventually re, uh, reside where we uh, where we think it's best for everybody. Um, those decisions in the, in the case of scheduling largely take place. Uh, we usually try and announce our football schedule in October, and um, of course we don't always and have all the non-conference games done by then but uh, at least the league schedule will likely announce in uh, October of uh, 22 for the fall of 23 so uh, you know we're really only six or seven months from wow. from having a having a schedule exciting Big 12 Commissioner Bob Bowlesby is with us on BYU Sports Nation when I think about BYU transitioning into the Big 12 and natural rivalries TCU pops into my mind so if you want to push BYU towards another rivalry, quote-unquote, with TCU, I think that would be a fun thing. 
Well, I think there'll be a number of of rivalries that develop. Um, you know, I- interestingly enough, we uh, we added BYU in the West. We added Cincinnati and uh, Central Florida on the East, and and uh, Houston was a pretty easy addition. Uh, we we got a, a worldwide brand with BYU. Uh, we got three of the best recruiting uh, areas in in the country uh, with the the other three. And uh, you know they're all a little differently situated, but eventually they'll they'll tend towards the mean in in terms of what has become common practice in our league. And I just think it's going to be interesting to see how it shapes up because after having been at the the BYU Baylor game, uh, I would tell you I think there is the the, the nuggets <laughs> of a rivalry there. It felt like it, right? And, and uh, right? you know it was uh, it was a great crowd and and there was a lot. Of blue and white in the stands, and uh, so you know, I, I think uh, we probably won't spend a lot of time trying to force rivalries, but but let those evolve a little bit. And uh, uh, you know, TCU is a uh, is a worthy rivalry opponent. There isn't any doubt about that. And and they're in a little bit of transition because uh, for the first time in uh, in decades, uh, Gary Patterson's not going to be coaching their football team. Yep. Nope. We're familiar with Gary from uh, the Mountain West, so yeah, it'll be interesting. Okay, so. When when a, a a father has a new child, he gets new dad strength, right? That happens. That it didn't <laughs> that happen a, to me, but it happens typically. <laughs> it felt like new Power Five strength happened to BYU and Cincy and Houston, and it was there a validating moment there where you were like, okay, I already knew I wanted these four, but oh my gosh, they had tremendous seasons this year. Especially in football and now in basketball, it's been pretty good with Houston too. Right? Yeah, that's a really good question, I, and I don't know if I had an aha moment on it. Although we followed the progress of of all the new teams throughout the fall, not surprisingly. But you know, one of the places where you can uh, you can actually look at it from a statistical standpoint, uh, we looked at it, uh, the addition of the four in basketball and the deletion of the two uh, that uh, will eventually leave. And uh, our net uh, improved as a result of adding <laughs> those schools. And, uh, you know, I, I would suggest that uh, we will compete exceedingly well in every sport, uh, particularly football and men's and women's basketball, uh, because they, like BYU, uh, there are great traditions. Uh, there are great traditions among our continuing members and, and the four editions. Uh, you know, we we went out and tried to make athletic decisions uh, on who's the best athlete out there. To put it in the recruiting vernacular, um, you know, you you may not be recruiting entirely by position. You're you're recruiting by who's the best athlete. And um, BYU's program athletically has been extraordinary over a very very long period of time, and uh, just brings tremendous credibility to our to our league and aspirationally uh we want to win national championships uh and and that's not just in a few sports we'd like to win national championships and everything and that means being good enough to be in the playoff in football and being good enough to be in the final four in basketball and and win national championships and so uh we're we're going to be good in a very broad array of sports and uh the the schools that are coming in have big alumni bases uh, worldwide followings uh Great recruiting, uh, you know the. the I, I think uh, I think BYU's recruiting will be assisted by having Houston in the state of Texas. I mean, they reside in Harris County, Texas, which is arguably the best recruiting county in the entire United States for football players. So, um, there's. I think there's going to be a tremendous impact. And as I've talked with coaches while we've been on campus, um, to a person, they've said it's having a tangible effect on our recruiting. And, uh, you know, I think that's a good early indication. Um, it, it, isn't the, it isn't the final verdict, but, but that's a really good early indication. And so I, I think uh, rivalries help to drive that. Um, you know, a kid from Texas uh, wants to know that he's going to get to play in front of his family once in a while. Well, he can, he can go to BYU and know that he's going to be playing in front of his family. And so I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a great thing. And, and while we did go far and wide to add members, 
Um, we also didn't add anybody that's farther away from Dallas than Morgantown, West Virginia. So it, it's, um, you know, we, we just we're in three time zones. Uh, we've got great traditions. Uh, we've got great recruiting areas, great alumni bases. Um, it has all the ingredients of being extraordinarily successful. Big 12 Commissioner Bob Bowlesby is with us on BYU Sports Nation. You've probably already answered this question in large part by saying that you anticipate Oklahoma and Texas to be with the league through 2025. What's the relationship like with those two schools as they transition out and you welcome the four teams in? Do you expect that things will go status quo through 25? It's it's hard to tell. We you know we don't have control over that. Um, the 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 public comments and the private comments from uh, Oklahoma and Texas have been that they're going to meet their obligations. Uh, we have two governing documents that uh, we have all agreed to to adhere to. One is our bylaws, and it says you commit for ninety nine years, and if you leave, you uh, you leave two years of of net revenue, uh, which is if you lo- use the last two years, it's about seventy five million dollars per institution. Um, but the other document that guides us and, and will eventually put a new version of this in place is a is a grant of media rights that allows us to go forth and and uh, negotiate and manage our, our television media and, and to a certain extent some other smaller uh, tranches of media. And uh, the, the grant of rights is built around uh, federal copyright law. So it uh, Unlike the bylaws where we'd have to go to court in Oklahoma or Texas, uh, the grant of rights is, uh, is going to be heard in a federal jurisdiction. And, wow. and uh, we, we feel like we have pretty good law on our side. So um, you, you take their comments uh, for what they are and, and uh, rely on the, on the, the documents that we, we all agreed to. Um, I, I expect that they'll be here through, through June of, of 25. Uh, whether that happens or not, I you know I, I suppose that uh, there could be bumps in the road along the way, but uh, they've told us they're going to be here, and we expect that they'll be here. The current TV contract goes through the twenty four twenty five athletic season, correct? Correct. When do you start negotiating for the next one, given what you know of the new league and the changing landscape? Everyone always talks about at some point a OTT provider will be the main. No one's actually done that quite yet as the primary source, right? So uh, I guess what does that kind of look like in the future? Well, uh, we actually were an early adopter on some of the streaming technology. We we got involved with ESPN Plus uh, before uh, any other league did. And and I think um, it, the, the, uh, the financial aspects – of um, sports television are are unsettled at the present time. You know, we're we're migrating from linear cable to streaming, and I don't think there's any any doubt that we're on the right side of of uh, technology. Um, who knows if there'll be a new technology at some point in time that'll replace streaming? It, it, we didn't we didn't know about streaming seven or eight years ago, but. Um, that sort of disruption, that sort of transition, I think is going to be with us for a while. Uh, we have a, a look in on our on our contracts that uh, it starts in early 24. And uh, we have uh, part of our contract is with ESPN, part of it with Fox. Uh, we'll go back to both partners and, and begin having some conversations. But there are some indications that um, there are going to be more players involved in the space than there have been in the past, more that would like to get involved with college football particularly. And and we derive, uh, as a conference, we derive about 80% of our revenue from our football product. Um, we put 105 basketball games on TV, men's basketball. Um, and then we have um, each institution generates between 50 and 60 events a year for uh, ESPN+. Plus. And um, we, we largely are not being compensated for that right now, but we will be in the new day. And, and then, you know, data rights management has gotten to be a, a big component that will be part of that negotiation as well. So um, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a new day, and, uh, and, and we need to negotiate in ways that reflect that. But uh, live sports is today and always has been the coin of the realm. It's, uh, you, you look at linear cable as an example. 
people, uh, 93 or four of the top 100 events are live sports <laughs> and, and like NFL, right? It, yeah. Well, yeah. a lot of it's NFL, yeah. but there's a, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of college football and, and final mm-hmm. four and things like that, yeah. that get on there as well. So, um, you know, it's, uh, owning live sports is a good thing yeah. and it's always going to be valuable. And, um, it, it, it fits together a little differently than it, than it has in the past. Yeah. But, uh, and you know, the, the companies don't have an almost endless flow of, of cable subscription fees to, to give away a, as rights fees, but, um, it's an evolving environment and, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a, a welcome, uh, group of, of suitors out there, and I, I think we'll do well in, when it's time to go to auction. So whether we extend with our current partners or, or uh, um, go to a true open marketplace is yet to be determined. Fascinating stuff with the Big 12 Commissioner Bob Bowlesby. I'm exhausted for you thinking about everything that has to happen. <laughs> and so with that in mind, we need to, we need to leave, you have to leave Provo on a sugar high. So if you haven't already, you need to get a mint fudge brownie Grab some Lavelle's vanilla and get one of those three foot long maple bar donuts called Cougar Tails. Yeah, well, I I uh, I I was defeated by a Cougar Tail last <laughs> evening. I got I got back to my I got back to my room and I I, I got about a third of the way into it and, and I, I just couldn't do it. That's pretty I was, good. I was completely wired. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't sleep all night. <laughs> Bob, we thank you for the time. I uh, really appreciate you coming in to hang out with us on BYU Sports Nation. Great to be with you guys. Thanks. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Does it all come down to beat St. Mary's or bust when we're discussing BYU men's basketball and their chances of an at-large in the NCAA tournament? Is it really that simple and dramatic? Or, Jerem, is there an at-large path to the NCAA tournament that does not include BYU beating St. Mary's on Saturday? The only path that exists where you don't beat St. Mary's is beating Gonzaga in the semis. Really? That's the only path I really see. I just, I just think it's going to be hard um, to be Okay, because listen, BYU is barely in. So if BYU loses Saturday, BYU is out. What is BYU going to do to climb back in? Now, we don't know how the bubble's going to be. We don't know what teams are going to clinch bids and what won't and how that will affect BYU. Thus far, the bubble is weak, but we don't know what's going to happen in tournament week. Right, and I don't want to leave it up to chance. I would like to leave it up to merit, which is win Saturday, and then you've got to – You've got to hopefully, if you're on Gonzaga's side, you just play a competitive game and then you hope for the best. If you're not on Gonzaga's side, which would be incredible, somehow BYU got the three seed at that point, then you need to probably win that semifinal. And then you're like, okay, we're in a pretty good spot. You're still sweaty um, on, on Selection Sunday, <laughs> but, but you put on some deodorant and you're feeling confident, right, <laughs> that you won't sweat through your shirt. You've got some deodorant on if you beat St. Mary's. If you beat St. Mary's <laughs> and or you, like, get that semi. My concern is that if BYU doesn't beat St. Mary's, that they have no shot at being on the other side of the bracket at, of Gonzaga. It feels like BYU would be the four or five seed. And, we again, we still don't know. Like, I'm telling you, Ken Palm adjusted win percentage is coming. It's Like, the league is not going to make up all those games. They're not going to do just straight-up win percentage. It feels like that will happen. Okay. So we're going to see it this week or early next week, you'd think, because next week's the last week of the regular season. Then we'll have a sense of what seed BYU could be in the tourney. But without a win against St. Mary's, it feels like it's going to be extremely difficult. So to me, for the NCAA tournament hopes, which we say at large, BYU hasn't won a conference tournament since 01. I think that BYU may go the rest of history without winning a conference tournament tournament in men's basketball, Spencer, mm, mm. because you're, you're not going to beat the Sags. I'm sorry. It, like, if BYU does, amazing. Spencer will shave his head. But then you go to the Big 12, <laughs> you ain't winning that one either. Like, you think it's hard to win the WCC. BYU couldn't even win the Mountain West since I won. Like, it ain't happening in the Big 12, which we'll get to in the whip, by the way. There's two 4-9 and nine teams in league who are in the bracket. Yeah. 4-9 and nine in league, in the bracket. Brace yourself for BYU having that situation. Several times. So I don't really see an at-large path 
without beating St. Mary's that doesn't include a win over Gonzaga. Hear me out. And I already mentioned the weak bubble, but conference championship week can put in some weird bid stealers. You know, I, you're right. BYU shouldn't leave it up to that. But just maybe there is enough merit available left even after a loss to St. Mary's. Okay? Again, I know it sounds crazy to think, wait, BYU could still get in as an at-large if they lose to St. Mary's. Well, what else is left on their resume, or what could they even potentially put on their resume other than beating Gonzaga? I present to you, if BYU is the five seed, Jerem, let's mm-hmm. say that they lose to St. Mary's, they finish nine and six, and to me, nine and six in league with the Ken Palm adjusted metric that we are anticipating in play would probably put BYU at a five seed, at best a four seed, depending on what San Francisco and Santa Clara do. At best a four seed. But if BYU is playing on Friday, then you just win a game, probably have to beat Pacific or LMU. Then on No guarantees Saturday, against Pacific. Then on Saturday, <laughs> BYU would play either San Francisco or Santa Clara. Now, if I'm yeah. looking at the resume, I'm hoping it's San Francisco that BYU has to play in a quarterfinal sure. on Saturday because all of right a sudden now. you yeah. have a quad one game. Yeah. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. St. Mary's beat San Francisco last night. Woo! Does, does this leave the door open for the three seed for Oregon? Yes, especially if BYU can somehow figure out a way to beat St. Mary's and Moraga tomorrow night. Yeah, if BYU loses tomorrow, there's no way. There's nope. No. That, so that, they, they that absolutely has to happen for BYU to have any shot at the three seed. They have to beat St. Mary's for that. There's no way BYU can be the three without beating St. Mary's tomorrow. We don't need the Ken Palm just win percentage. No. Know that. But we don't know. Like, looking at the standings right now is a fruitless endeavor because if they if and when they switch, it feels like it's going to happen next week. Ken Palm just win percentage will be different metrics. Not everyone's played each other. Not the, 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 We'll see what it is, man. You know what? I can guarantee you San Francisco is going to finish with six league losses because they still have to play Gonzaga, yeah. and they already have five. Well, welcome to the six, six league loss club, you know? Good grief. Well, hopefully BYU can avoid that, right, by beating St. Mary's. So bad, dude. Also, uh, resume update, not great right now, Jerem. Not great, Bob. Not great, Bob. 51 in the net, 46 Ken Palm. Hey, 46 in Ken Palm. What happened to push BYU up seven spots from a couple of days ago? Super efficient the last couple of days of practice. However, BYU is the first team out in bracketology. This is the first time they've been out, what, all year? Since they got in, I think, right? Team ranking says BYU <gasps> at 14.9% chance to make the tournament. How would that change if BYU beat St. Mary's? Hopefully we'll find out. On uh, on Sunday. That is your resume update for BYU men's basketball. Now back to football. Tyler Algier projected as one of the top five running backs on the Pro Football Full Focus Big Board at number five. Will he be one of the top five running backs drafted when all is said and done? I really hope so because I think that'll mean, you know, third or fourth round at that point. If he's fifth plus, it's like, shoot, hoping for third or fourth. Yeah, if he's the fifth running back drafted, I would think that's like, Probably late third round. At worst, early fourth round. I think he deserves it, Jerem. And I think his metrics at the Combine are only going to increase his stock because I think he will surprise people with how fast he is. If he runs like a 4.55 plus, yeah, he's not going to be one of the top five. But if he can run a 4.4, which he has before, then boom goes the deadline. He's run a 4.38 laser time. That's crazy. Now if he runs a 4.4, we were disappointed. International, uh, you know, tug of war day tomorrow. BYUSN's IG account will feature two semifinal tug of war contests. <laughs> so go to BYUSN's Instagram stories and vote on this today. <laughs> so Team A has Shep, Sadie Miner, Van Tassel, Foose, Sean Olmstead, Jennifer Rockwood against okay. Kiki, Lauren Gustin, Kairos Tonga, Mark Pope, and Doji Taylor. Team A or B? I'm going with Team B. Come on, Jeremy. I can't go against any team that features Kyrus Tonga. I'm going A. I think Foose will bring it there. Really? Okay. Kyrus and, and Lauren? C and Ooh. D. Greg, Heather Knighting, Jacob Wilk of baseball, Klein Stock, Kerry Roberts versus <laughs> Blaine Fowler, Cassidy Smith of soccer, Davide Gardini, Jeff 
Judkins and Heather Olmstead. Who you got? Team C, baby. <laughs> Team Kalani and Greg. I think I have C on that one as well. <laughs> Go vote on the BYSN Instagram stories. Tomorrow we'll have the championship matchup on International Tug of War. International Tug of War Day is a real thing. And we, with open arms, have embraced that. It's a real thing. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. We've mentioned several times our conversation with Bob Bowlesby, and it was so good, Jerem, that we need to revisit. It was great, Bob. We need to revisit some of the specific comments from the commish, starting with, how many games will BYU play as a member of the Big 12 Conference? A lot of discussion about eight or nine. Bob Bowlesby giving us his opinion on which direction he would lean if he were making the decision. Well, I'm an advocate for nine games because I think our qual- I think our conference quality is is good enough that that's a that's a valuable thing for us. I, I think you know we're going to be at 14 for a couple of years, and and so uh, playing a full uh, round robin is not in the cards and. Uh, so I, I think you want to minimize the number of no plays you have if you possibly can. I think I think that's one of the things that make great leagues is great rivalries, and uh, so uh, we're going to do everything we can to have that happen. Once once we get to twelve, uh, we'll probably take a different look at it. Okay, so what I'm gathering from that, Jeremy, is for at least the first three seasons, twenty three, twenty four, and twenty five. Right. Okay. Well, I guess yeah. 24 and or 23 and 24, there's going to be nine conference games. He, then, want, he wants it. Yeah. yeah. Then, then when it goes to 12 teams, maybe it drops down to eight. We'll see. But like, I, I feel like strongly for the first two years, if he wants it and there are 14 I, teams, yeah. it's going to be nine conference games. I don't games. know what dropping Texas and Oklahoma has to do with you know going down to eight. I would think it'd stay at nine at that point, but we'll see. Well, you could make it a little bit more clean uh, in terms of scheduling from year to year. If you, had, if you have 12 teams in a conference – and there are six in each division. You play the five in your division, and then you play one half of the other division. That's eight games. And so then it's like, okay, well, who are we going to play next year? The other half of the other division, along with the five in our immediate division. Yeah. So. Yeah. It depends what you value in non-conference and the opportunity to play in, uh, you know, the playoff or the college. Yeah. It depends how much you value conference play. Right now they have the true round robin, which is – Everybody plays everybody. What I'm very excited about is we will know in October what BYU's Big 12 schedule will look like. We'll know whether it's 8 or 9. I bet we'll know before then that it's 8 or 9. We'll just know exactly who BYU's playing. That is BYU super be, exciting. BYU won't play everybody, right? There's a chance BYU does not play Texas and Oklahoma. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, okay. Then we asked about TV contracts and kind of where that's headed because – they have two more years, uh, and then it's up. So what now? We have a, a look in on our on our contracts that uh, it starts in early 24. And uh, we have uh, part of our contract is with ESPN, part of it with Fox. Uh, we'll go back to both partners and, and begin having some conversations. But there are some indications that um, there are going to be more players involved in the space than there have been in the past, more that would like to get involved with college football particularly. And, and we derive, uh, as a conference, we derive about 80% of our revenue from our football product get used to the the games aren't all going to be on espn right um and it doesn't matter like there are basic options that get you the channels that BYU is going to be on i wouldn't worry about it and it's 2022 when BYU went in india it was 2010 like hd was newish <laughs> like we've progressed a lot well and with some of the progressive companies that he also referenced hey there are some new things some new partners that want to get involved with college football specifically that tells me that that will drive up the price. Could, and I, I don't see um, the Big 12 or any major conference going to a, lin- a non-linear only consistent as the primary provider. I'm not talking secondary tertiary, the second and third picks. I'm talking primary provider will still be a major TV company, you'd think. But who knows? Maybe Amazon's a huge fan of Lord of the Rings and the Big 12 football. <laughs> like, and they throw stupid money, and it's like, you have to have Amazon Prime Video or Amazon Video to get. 
I don't know, but no one's actually done that yet where they're like, we are OTT for the primary provider. Well, and I know a lot of people were concerned, well, I mean, it's like $37.5 million per team in the Big 12 right now. Is it going to go all the way down to like 20? I don't think it's going to be that big of a hit. Yeah, I don't know what it'll be, but I'm excited because it's going to be double or quadruple what BYU is at now. It's going to be awesome either way. More money. And the first two years different than what we were talking about. What we were talking about is when they get a new TV contract. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. And catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio.